Welcome to Thousand Springs State Park in South Central Idaho. Uh, I'm standing at one of the, the base of one of the springs here. We also have the power plant, but you can also see some of the, the springs in the canyon walls just down the way. Um, and this is one of the more scenic locations uh, in this part of Idaho. You can see this just beautiful kind of blue green, just crystal clear water uh, where the springs uh, come out of the rocks here and then flow uh, into the Snake River Canyon. Uh, over here we have Ritter Island, kind of an old uh, farm homestead area. And then just beyond that is the Snake River proper. So we're gonna focus in this video on um, groundwater and this big aquifer that occupies this portion of uh, Idaho, South, South Central Idaho. This is the Eastern Snake River Plain Aquifer. It's a large, one of the largest fractured, walk, fractured rock aquifers uh, in the lower 48 states. Most aquifers are where we have groundwater in gravel or sand or some other sedimentary deposit. But here in Idaho, we have these basalts up on the rim here. Uh, so these volcanic rocks that host all the groundwater we see uh, in this region. Of course, this groundwater is important to this portion of Idaho. Not only does it supply power, such as here at the power plants, but this water, which comes out of the ground at about something like 48 degrees, um, is cold enough and clear enough that it becomes uh, a really good habitat for fish hatcheries. And so there's an aquaculture industry built up around uh, the spring water that comes out of the Snake River Canyon. Of course, the water is also used for agriculture as well um, and other industries. So let's kind of start here with maybe a, a basic map and an overview of um, what exactly we have here. So this is uh, just my little rendition of uh, Idaho. So you can see here we have the eastern part of the snake and the Snake River coming out of the Yellowstone region and flowing across the state from east to west. Uh, a couple towns I put in here, Idaho Falls, Pocatello, down here is Twin Falls, Hagerman, which is pretty close to where we are now here at Thousand Springs. And then over here we have Boise and Sun Valley. I've got the, the mountains more or less crudely shown here with the little green symbol here. Uh, so you can see there's big mountains to the north in central Idaho, mountains in southeastern Idaho, and then we have the Snake River Plain, this largely flat area that's underlain by uh, all the volcanic rocks, the basalts, the lava flows that have erupted over the last few million years. And so this is the Eastern Snake River Plain Aquifer, shown and outlined in blue. And here down in the Hagerman Valley, around Thousand Springs, we have a huge amount of water that comes out of the ground, more so than any other place in the Snake River Plain. So that begs the question, why here? Why do we have so many springs coming out in this location as opposed to you know, Twin Falls and other places uh, in the Snake River Plain? And the answer to that is the sort of the geometry between the Snake River and the groundwater flowing through it. So as snow melt and, and surface water feeds from the mountains into the Snake River Plain, it encounters these basalts, these volcanic rocks, these lava flows. And these are incredibly uh, porous and permeable rock types. And I'll explain those two words here in a second. The point is that a lot of that water seeps down into the ground, uh, becomes groundwater. So it goes from being a surface water source into the ground, seeps into the volcanic rocks, becoming groundwater. And the groundwater you can see more or less parallels the Snake River. The Snake River is kind of flowing in this section, kind of to the southwest. The groundwater is largely uh, mirroring it. But here, in this portion of South Central Idaho, the Snake River takes an abrupt turn to the north. And that's where the groundwater flow, which is sort of to the west-southwest, intersects the Snake River Canyon. And so this is why we have so many springs in the Snake River Canyon in this area here is because the groundwater coming through the cliffs here is intersecting this section of the canyon where the river takes this dramatic turn here 
uh, in the Hagerman Valley and around Thousand Springs. So uh, just kind of a, an, an interesting note as to why so much of the groundwater is discharged in this section uh, of the Snake River Canyon. Let's do a little um, demonstration. I have something over here on this picnic table. This is uh, one of the parks here down at Ritter Island. You can kind of see one of the waterfalls there in the background. Um, but I want to explain the difference between porosity and permeability. And so I've got two containers here, one filled with gravel and another filled with sand. And to sort of illustrate porosity and permeability, I thought this would be a nice thing to do out here. And so porosity is basically how much of the material, whether it's sediment or rocks itself, is pore space. So it's a percentage. You can see these are filled about to the 500 milliliter mark with their respective materials, gravel and sand. And so of course we can add water to both of these materials and the water is gonna seep into the pore spaces between the grains. Um, so that's porosity. And I'm not gonna do this in a, a quantifiable way, but gravel and sand have pretty comparable por porosities, something in the neighborhood of 25 to 40%. And so in both of these, we're gonna be able to add water to both of these um, and, and, and about the same amount of water to each of these beakers. Permeability is a little bit different. Permeability is how quickly the water can get through the material. Or in other words, it's how well connected the pore spaces are, <clears throat> excuse me, to allow the, the water to move through. And so if you had to take a guess right now, which one do you think would be the more permeable material, the sand or the gravel? Uh, and if you answered the gravel, you're right. And we'll show that here in a second. The pore spaces are so much larger in the gravel that the water can move through very quickly. Whereas with the sand, even though it has the same percentage of porosity, uh, the pore spaces are so small that it takes the water a lot longer to get through. So we'll go ahead and kind of show that here. So we'll pour some water in there and automatically you can see the water hit the bottom of the gravel because those pore spaces are so well connected. This is a highly permeable <coughs> material, the gravel, okay? And then let's go with the uh, the sand now and see what what we get here. And as you'd expect, it takes much longer for the water to work its way down. You can see it bubbling at the top because the water is displacing the air. And you can see the water starting to track down under the influence of gravity uh, through the sand itself. So it's taking the water quite a bit longer <clears throat> to get through the sand than it did the gravel. So this is a much lower permeable uh, material versus the gravel. Even though the amount of water that we're gonna end up adding to these, even though I haven't measured it out, uh, believe me, I've done this several times in class. It's about the same. So it's comparable amounts of porosity in each one. So we can maybe tap this one a little bit, kind of get it going. But you can see it working its way through. Under the influence of gravity, uh, the water is slowly but surely making its way through the container there. So, um, okay, that's probably good enough for that. Uh, one other thing I want to share here, and then we're going to go to another location. Uh, let me change my paper here is we're going to look a little bit at the specific geology here uh, at this portion of thousand springs so the snake river is a couple hundred yards to our to the west of us um, and then a lot of the springs here down at thousand springs again they're moving their way down through uh, basalts and we have two major basalt units in this portion of the canyon the notch butte basalt which is about 80,000 or so uh, years old. And then below that is the Gooding Butte Basalt. These are named after the, the buttes or the, the shield volcanoes that erupted these two types of basalts, which is uh, about 373,000 years old. And so the water has worked its way through those and it's discharging near the base of the Gooding Butte Basalt, but above another unit which sits below it, which is the Glens Ferry Formation, a sedimentary unit mostly sandstones, mudstones, siltstones, that sort of thing, that's anywhere from about three to six or so million years old. Um, this material, because it contains some finer grained or less permeable materials, uh, this represents what we kind of call a, a confining unit, meaning that the, the water can't get down as easily through the Glens Ferry Formation, and that's why it discharges here uh, out of the canyon walls to form the springs here. 
So just kind of a quick overview of some of the things we see down here at Thousand Springs. Great little place to come recreate in the summer. This place is uh, busy on a Saturday with people fishing, uh, playing in the water, picnicking, that sort of thing. But we're gonna head up the road now and go look at the actual springs themselves. So you can get a closer look at the springs uh, <clears throat> here at Thousand Springs and actually get a good look at the groundwater and the rock types there. Okay, I've come up the road a bit from the Thousand Springs Park uh, and right along the roadway here as you drive down into the park, uh, you can see the springs actually emanating from the canyon walls here. Um, and it's really quite remarkable to look at these and think about the journey that this water's taken to get here. This is all water. This groundwater uh, fell as probably snow, maybe maybe surface water or rain, who knows, but it, this was all water that was in <clears throat> central or eastern Idaho and it flowed down into the Snake River Plain and uh, permeated down through those basalts, those high permeability basalts, and has been traveling underground through the rocks, through the pore spaces for about 150 to 200 years. We've actually done tracer studies on how long it takes this water to travel through the system. And we get uh, numbers in the about, yeah, 150 to 200 year range. So this is all groundwater that's been trapped in the dark, fighting through the nooks and crannies in the rock for upwards of 200 years. And now it's finally emerging uh, into the light of day here down at Thousand Springs. We talked before about permeability, and this is a great place to see how much variability there is in the permeability of the basalts. If we look, up here at the top end of the cliff, we can see these dark basalts have well-formed columns in them. They're quite dense, more or less, overall. There's not a lot of permeability in those basalts, except where we see some of the fractures forming there. Then as we move down a little bit into the central portion of this outcrop here, we can see it's a little more shattered, so the permeability looks like it's increased quite a bit. Again, mainly just fractures, though, that forms the permeability. Straight across from me here, there, you might be able to make out some of the little uh, little bubbles in there, the vesicles, and those are only going to be permeable if they're interconnected. The main permeability is going to be these fractures. <clears throat> but the main area where we're seeing these springs emerge tends to be along this zone, this more or less horizontal uh, trend. And I'll kind of walk down the road a bit here so you can see all the different locations where we see the groundwater emerging. And what you might be able to pick out is that there's some kind of rounded shapes in here along with the springs. The permeability is definitely greater than in any other part of this uh, basalt cliff face that we see here. And so what we have then is we have some enhanced permeability along this zone. And as we look at a lot of these springs in the Snake River Canyon, <clears throat> we see that these springs tend to emerge in places where we have this kind of permeability architecture. In other words, they tend to occur in places where we have a lot of these pillow lavas. It's a little tricky to tell in here, but a lot of these rounded shapes in here are actually pillow lavas or what we sometimes call pillow basalts. Let me explain that a little bit better with a, a simple cartoon diagram. So we have the Snake River Canyon and other small stream systems in south central Idaho. And then, of course, we've talked about these big uh, volcanic eruptions that take place from time to time. The lava goes downhill. Ultimately, it's going to head towards the river because that's the lowest area in that given location or landscape. So as the lava comes off the canyon rim and starts to head for the river, the next thing that happens is the lava actually goes into the river and when lava and water interact in this way, the lava gets quenched and cooled very quickly, forms these kind of rounded or oval shapes called pillow lavas or pillow basalts. Those will tend to form below the water line of the river or stream. And then above that, we'll just get more typical uh, basalts, what we sometimes call subaerial basalts. The point is that these pillow basalts, just by their uh, geometries and the way they form have much higher permeabilities than the basalt itself. And so these become the preferred pathways or conduits 
for the groundwater to move through the system. These become really the highways for the groundwater to move through the basalt uh, and then ultimately emerge at these springs here. And so we see that these springs are emerging mainly where we get these um, pillow basalts that are kind of piling up here. And so we'll walk back down this way. Sorry, there was a truck there that just was sitting next to me. <clears throat> to look at some of the architecture of these, these basalts in here. So these pillow lavas tend to be the main conduits. Why do we see the springs in the locations that we do? It tends to be in these places where we've had these these canyon filling lavas forming the pillow basalts uh, that are piled into these regions. These form the main conduits or pathways for the groundwater to flow here. <clears throat> so an important part of Idaho's, especially Southern Idaho's, not just geologic history, but human history, these, um, these groundwater features here, um, it's important because it provides the agriculture, the industry, uh, the water resources that we have in this area. We all owe that to uh, what's taken place here, both geologically and with the groundwater that's kind of um, occupied these pillow lavas here. So hopefully you enjoyed this little video, teaching you a little bit more about uh, the groundwater of Southern Idaho and the Eastern Snake River Plain Aquifer. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share the video with others. And feel free if you feel uh, like you want to donate. There's a donate button on the banner. And there's a PayPal link under the description. And I appreciate anyone who can support the videos. And thanks so much for joining me and learning with me.